From the Cube Studios in Palo Alto and Boston, connecting with thought leaders all around the world, this is a Cube Conversation. Hey everybody, welcome to this week's Cube Insights, powered by ETR. My name is Dave Vellante, and we've been reporting every week, really, on the COVID-19 impact uh, on budgets. Sagar Kadakia is back in with me. Sagar, it's great to see you. Really. Thanks again for having me, Dave. You're very welcome. Sagar is, of course, the Director of Research at ETR, our, our data partner. And man, I mean, you guys have just been digging into the data. We're, of course, just to sort of reiterate, we're down, you know, roughly around minus 5% for the year. The thing about what we're doing here, and where I want to stress to the audience, that, that's going to change. The key point is we don't just do a, a placeholder and, you know, update you in December. Every time we get new information, we're going to convey it to you. So, so let's get right into it. What we want to do today is do kind of part two from the takeaways that we did last week. Uh, so let's start with the macro guys. If you bring up the, the first chart, uh, Saga, take us through kind of the top three takeaways and just kind of reiterate where we're at. Yeah, no problem. And look, as you mentioned, uh, what we're doing right now is we're, we're collecting the pulse of CIOs. And so things change uh, and we continue to expect them to change, you know, in the next few weeks and next few months uh, as things change with COVID. So just to kind of give a quick recap of the survey and then kind of going through some of our top macro takeaways. So uh, in March, mid-March, uh, we launched our technology spending intention survey. We had 1,250 CIOs approximately take that survey. They provided their updated 2020 versus 2019 spending intentions, right? So effectively, they first gave us those 2020 versus 2019 spending intentions in January, and then they went ahead and, and updated those uh, based on what happened with COVID. Um, and then in tandem with that, we did this kind of COVID-19 drill down survey where we asked CIOs to kind of estimate the budget impact um, of COVID-19 versus what they originally forecast in the year. And so that kind of leads us to our first takeaway here, uh, where we essentially aggregated the data from all of these CIOs in that COVID-19 drill down survey. And we saw a revision of 900 basis points, so down to a decline of 5%. And so coming into the year, the consensus was about 4% growth. Uh, and now you can see we're down about 5% uh, for the year. And again, that's subject to change. And we're going to, again, remeasure that uh, as we kind of get into June, July, and we have a couple of months under our belt uh, with, with COVID-19. Uh, the second big takeaway here is, you know, the industries that are really indicating uh, those declines in spend, retail, consumer, airlines, financials, telco, IT services, and consulting, those are the verticals, uh, as we mentioned last week, that are really seeing some of the largest pullbacks in spend from consumers and businesses. So it makes sense that they are revising their budgets uh, downwards the most. Uh, and then finally, uh, the, the last thing we captured that we spoke about last week, as well as a few weeks before that, and I think you know that's really been playing out the last kind of week and a half with earnings is CIOs are continuing to press the pedal on, on digital transformation, right? We saw that with Microsoft, with ServiceNow last night, right? Those companies continue to post good numbers, continue to see good demand. What we're seeing and where those declines that we just mentioned earlier are, are, are coming from, it's, it's the legacy, it's the on-prem, it's the pure plays. There, there's such a concentration of, of loss and deceleration within some of those companies, and we'll kind of get into that more uh, as, as, you know, as we go through more slides, but that's really what kind of here, you know, that's really what we need to focus on is the declines are coming from uh, very select vendors. Yeah, and of course, you know, we're, we're in earnings season now and we're paying you know, close attention to that. A lot of people say, oh, I just ignore the earnings here. You know, you got the COVID-19 mm -hmm. mulligan, but, but that's really not right. I mean, obviously you want to look at balance sheets, you want to look at cash flows, but also we're squinting through some of the data. Your point mm -hmm. about IT services and consulting is interesting. I saw another research firm put out that, you know, services and consulting was going to be okay. Our data shows, you know, different. Uh, and we're watching, for instance, Jim Cavanaugh on IBM's earnings mm -hmm. call was, you know, very specific about the, the metrics that they're watching. They're obviously, very concerned about the pricing and their ability to, to book business there. Uh, we saw the cloud guys uh, announce. Uh, mm -hmm. Google was up uh, in, the, in the strong 50s. The estimate is GCP was even higher, up in the 80% range. Azure, you know, we'll talk about this, killing it. I mean, you guys have been all over, uh, you know, Microsoft and, and its presence, you know, high 50s. AWS solid at, at around 34% growth from a larger base, but as we've been reporting, you know, downturns, they've been, they've been good to cloud. That's right. And uh, I think, you know, based on the, the data that we've captured, um, you know, it's, people are really pressing the pedal 
uh, on cloud and, and, and SaaS. Uh, with this much remote work, you need to have uh, you know, that structure in place to maintain productivity. Okay, let's bring up the, the next uh, slide now. Uh, we've been reporting a lot on the sort of next generation workload. Mm -hmm. Cloud 1.0, all about you know, storage and, and infrastructure as a service, compute. There's an, an, you know, obviously some database, but there's a new analytics workload emerging. Uh, and, and it's kind of replacing, or at least disintermediating or disrupting mm -hmm. the traditional EDWs. I've said for years, EDW has you know, failed to live up to its expectations of 360 degree insights and mm -hmm. you know, real time data. And that's really what we're showing here is some of the traditional EDW guys are, are getting hit and some of the emerging guys um, are looking pretty good. So take us through what we're looking at here, Sagar. Yeah, no problem. So we're looking at the database data warehousing sector. Uh, what you're looking at here is replacement rates. Um, and so as an example, uh, if you see a company with roughly 20% replacement, what that means is one out of five people who took the survey uh, for that particular sector for that vendor indicated that they were replacing. And so you can see here for Teradata and Cloudera, IBM, Oracle, uh, they have very elevated and accelerating replacement rates. And so when we kind of think about this space, you can really see the, the bifurcation, right? Look how uh, well positioned the Microsoft's, AWS's, Google, Mongo, Snowflake, low replacements, right? Low consistent replacements. And then of course, on the left hand side of the screen, you're really seeing elevated and accelerating. And so this space is, it, it kind of goes with that theme that we've been talking about that we covered last week bifurcation, right? When you think about the declines uh, that you're seeing in spend, again, it's very targeted towards a lot of these kind of legacy, uh, legacy vendors. And we're again, we're seeing a lot of the next gen players, the Microsofts, the AWS continue to post very strong data. And so here looking within database, uh, it, it's very clear as to which vendors look well positioned for 2020 and which ones look like they're being ripped out uh, and swapped out um, in the next few months. So this to me is really interesting. So, you know, you We've certainly reported on the impact that Snowflake is having on, on mm -hmm. Teradata and, mm -hmm. and, and some of IBM's business, the old Matiza business. You, kind of, you can see that here. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's interesting, uh, during the Hadoop days, Cloudera and Hortonworks, when they realized they couldn't really make money on Hadoop, they sort of try to get into the data management and data, database, and you know, you're seeing that is under pressure. It's kind of interesting to me, Oracle you know, is still not, what we're seeing with Teradata, right? Because they've got a, a stranglehold on the marketplace. So That's they're right. kind of That's hanging right. in there, right? That's um, right. But then Snowflake with no replacements is very impressive. Mongo, consistent performer. And then Google, AWS, Microsoft. AWS, of course, with Redshift, they did a one-time license with Paracel, which was an MPP database. They totally retooled the thing. And now they're sort of, interestingly, copycatting Snowflake separating compute from storage and doing mm -hmm. some other moves. And yet they're really strong partners. So yeah. some interesting Redshift, things going Dynamo on there. DB. Yeah, Redshift, DynamoDB, oh, they all look good. All these, all these AWS products uh, continue to screen very well uh, in, in the data warehousing space. So yeah, to, look, to your point, there's a clear divergence of which products CIOs want to use and which ones they no longer want in their stack. Yeah, the database market is very much now uh, fragmented. It used to be mm -hmm. kind of Oracle, DB2, SQL Server. As you mentioned, you got a lot of choices. Amazon, I, I think I counted you know, 10 data stores, maybe mm -hmm. more, DynamoDB, Aurora, yeah. Redshift, yep. on and on and on. Um, so really interesting space, a lot of activity. And that new workload that I'm talking about, taking uh, uh, analytic databases, bringing data science tooling into mm -hmm. uh, that, that space, and really driving these real-time insights that we've been reporting on. So that's, that's quite an exciting space. Let's talk about this whole workflow, ITSM, a service now just, just announced. Uh, they've been consistently crushing it. The Cube has been yep. following them for many, many years, whether you know, from the early days of Fred Luddy, through Slootman, uh, the, mm -hmm. the short time John Donahoe, and, and now Bill yep. McDermott is the CEO, but, but consistent performance uh, since the IPO. But, what are we actually showing here, Saga? Yeah, you guys so, can bring up that slide. Thank you. So, I, I, our, our key takeaway on kind of the ITM, I, ITSM, IT workflow space is: look, it's best in breed, which is ServiceNow, or or some of the lower cost providers, right? There's really no 
room for, for middle of the pack. So this is an interesting chart. And so what you're looking at here, there, there's a few derivatives. So I'll kind of walk you through it and then I'll, I'll walk through the actual results is we're looking within ServiceNow accounts. And so we're seeing how these companies are doing within or among customers that are using ServiceNow today. What you're looking at on the X axis is essentially shared market share or shared customers. And then on the Y axis, you're seeing essentially the spend velocity of those vendors within ServiceNow's accounts, right? So uh, if a vendor was doing well, you would see them moving up and to the right, right? That means they're having more customer overlap with ServiceNow and they're also accelerating spend. But you can see, if you look at Zendesk, if you look at BMC, Symantec, right? You can see uh, they're either losing market share and spend within ServiceNow accounts or they're losing spend, right? And Zendesk is another example here. Um, and what's actually interesting is, and we've had a lot of anecdotal evidence from CIOs, uh, is that, look, they start with ServiceNow, uh, it's best in breed, but a few of them have said, look, it, it's, it's gotten expensive. Um, and so they would move over to Zendesk and then they would look at it versus a comp versus Atlassian. And we had a few CIOs say, look, Atlassian is a quarter of the price of Zendesk. Um, and they moved away from Zendesk and subsequently went with Atlassian. And so it's just, it's interesting that, uh, you know, during these times where, you know, CIOs are reducing their budgets, um, that look, it's either best in breed or low cost. There's really no room in, in the middle. And so it's actually kind of interesting. Uh, in, in, in this space, it's, it's an interesting dynamic and, and a theme. Usually, uh, it's, it's best or breed or, or low cost. Rarely do you kind of see both win, and I think uh, that's what kind of makes this space a little interesting. Yeah, I've been following ServiceNow for a number of years. Uh, i just make a few comments there. Uh, first of all, you know, Workday was the gold standard in enterprise software for the longest mm -hmm. time, and you'll raise, you know, company, and, and, and I, I always considered ServiceNow to be kind of part of that, you know, Silicon mm -hmm. Valley Mafia with, uh, with Frank Sloop. Us. But what's happened is, you know, Slootman did a masterful job of identifying the total available market and then executing you know, with the team. And, and now, you know, his, his successors have taken it beyond there. You know, ServiceNow's market cap is not quite double, but I mean, I think Workday last I checked was in the mid 30s. ServiceNow's market valuation is up in the, the 60 billion range. I mean, they, they announced uh, uh, just recently, uh, it, very interestingly, they beat expectations. They lowered their guidance relative to consensus guidance. But the, the, I think the street knows, first of all, they, 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 they beat their number and they've got that SaaS model, that, that very predictable model. And I think people are saying, look, they're just leaving meat in the bone so they can continue to beat because that's been their sort of MO these last you know, several years. So you got to like their positioning and, and you, get, you talk to customers, they are pricey. You do hear complaints about that, yeah. but, and they've got a strong lock spec. But you know, generally, Saga, my experience is if people can identify business value and clear productivity, they can, can work through the lock-in, you know, and they'll just fight it out in the negotiations with procurement. That's right, and, and, and two things on that. So with, with ServiceNow and, and even Salesforce, right, they are a platform-like approach uh, type of vendors, right? Where you build on them, and that's what makes them such great companies, right? Uh, even if they have, you know, little nicks and knacks here and there when, when they report, people see past that, right? They understand their best in breed. You build your companies on the service nows and the sales forces of the world. And to the second point, you're exactly right. Businesses want to maintain consistent productivity. Um, and I think that, you know, is, is it kind of resonates with the theme, right? Doubling down on, on cloud and SaaS. Um, as, as you have all this remote work, as you have kind of a, you know, uh, questionable or deteriorating mark, you know, uh, macro environment, organizations want to make sure that their employees continue to execute, that they're generating consistent productivity and using these kind of best of breed tools uh, is, is the way to go. Yeah, it's interesting you mentioned uh, uh, Salesforce and ServiceNow. I've, for years I've been saying they're on a collision course. We haven't seen it yet but because they're both platforms. I, I still, uh, uh, I'm, I'm waiting for that to happen. Let's uh, bring up the next chart and let's get into networking. We we mm -hmm. we talked um, uh, a couple of weeks ago about the whole shift from traditional MPLS moving mm -hmm. to SD WAN, and this sort of really lays it out. Take us through the data here, Saga, please. Yeah, no problem. So we're just looking at a handful of vendors here. Really, we're looking at networking vendors that have the highest adoption rates 
within cloud accounts. And so what we did was we looked inside of AWS, Azure, GCP, right? We essentially isolated to just those customers. And then we said, which networking vendors are seeing the best spend data and the most adoptions within those cloud accounts? And so, yeah, you can kind of see some, uh, some themes here, right? SD-WAN, right? You can see Meraki there, VMware NSX, um, right? You see some next-gen load balancing, right? Cloudflare on the CDN side, right? Next-gen. And so you're seeing a theme here uh, of more next-gen players, uh, and you're not really seeing a lot of the MPLS vendors here, right? They're the ones that have more flattening, decreasing, and, and replacing data. And so, yeah, the reason just kind of going over the slide is, you know, when you kind of think about the networking space as a whole, this is where adoptions are going. This is, this is where spend's going. And you kind of categorize it uh, in, into what we just talked about. You know, networking is such a fascinating space to me because you got, you got the leader in Cisco that has, you know, that had held two thirds of the market for the longest time, mm -hmm. you know, despite uh, competitors like Arista and Juniper and, and others trying to get in there. And of course, you know, of course NX, NSX and the big Nicira acquisition, you know, kind of potentially disrupted that, but you can see, you know, Cisco, they, they don't go down without a fight and, uh, and uh, hanging tough there. Let's take a look right. at the, the next chart on CDN. Um, you know, this mm -hmm. is interesting. Uh, uh, you know, you'd think with all this activity around work from home and, and, and remote offices, this is a hot area, but uh, what are we looking at here? Yeah, no problem. And, and that's right, right? You would think, and so we're looking at CDN players here. You would think with the uptick in traffic, uh, you would see fantastic net scores, right? For, for all the CDN vendors. So. What you're looking at here, and again, there's a few lenses on here, so I'll kind of walk you, I'll kind of walk the audience through here, is first we isolated only those individuals that were accelerating their budgets due to work from home, right? So we've had this conversation now for a few weeks where to support employees working from home, you did see uh, a decent number of organizations, I think it was 20 or 30% of organizations that took our survey that indicated they're actually accelerating spend. So we're looking at those individuals, and then what we're doing is we're seeing how, are, how is Cloudflare and Akamai performing within those accounts, right? And so we're looking at those specific customers and you can just see uh, within Cloudflare and we track them in security and networking, which is probably more of the CDM piece, how consistent and elevated the data is, right? This is spend intensity, right? Not overall market share, because obviously Akamai, you know, they're the grandfather of CDNs. They have the most market share. And if you look at Akamai to the right now, you can see, the spend velocity is, is not very good. It's actually negative across, across both sectors. So, you know, it's not, we're not saying that, look, there's a changing of the guard that's occurring right now, right? Cloudflare is still relatively small compared to Akamai, but there's just such a stark contrast here. And again, it kind of goes to what we were talking about at, at our top macro themes, right? CIOs are continuing to invest in, in, in next gen technologies and better technologies. Uh, and that is having an impact on, on some of these legacy and kind of, you know, grandfather providers. Well, I mean, I think as we enter this again, I've said a number of times, it's ironic that COVID hit coming into a new decade. And you're seeing this throughout the IT stack where you've got a lot of disruptors and you've got companies with large install bases, a lot of on-prem or a lot of historical legacy. Uh, and, and it's very hard for them to show growth. Uh, they oftentimes squeeze R&D because they got to serve Wall Street. And mm -hmm. this is the kind of dilemma they're in. And you know, the only good news with Akamai here is there, it, it's less bad. You know, security going from negative 20% to a negative 8% net score. Mm -hmm. um, but wow, what a, what a con contrast. So the, to your point, much, much smaller base, but still very relevant. We've seen this mm -hmm. you know, movie before. Let's, right. let's wrap with another area that we've talked about, which is uh, uh, virtualization, specifically desktop virtualization, EDI. Uh, again, a, a, a beneficiary of the work from home pivot. Um, mm -hmm. And we're focused here, right, on Fortune 500 net scores, but uh, give us the uh, lowdown on this chart. Yeah, so this is something that, look, I think it's, it's pretty obvious to, to the market. You're seeing an uptick in spend across the board versus three months ago and a year ago in spend intensity. Among your desktop virtualization players, there's F5, right? So that's going to be kind of your, your, your VPN, right? And obviously they reported pretty good numbers there. So. This is an obvious slide, but we wanted to kind of throw it in there, just say, look, uh, you know, uh, these organizations are seeing nice upticks in spend, uh, you know, within the virtualization sector and specifically within Fortune 500. Uh, and again, that's kind of that, you know, work from home spend that we're seeing here. Right, so, uh, I mean, this is really 100% uh, net score 
in the Fortune 500 for workspaces is pretty amazing. And, and uh, I think the, uh, the shared end on this, the end was actually quite large. It wasn't like single digits, many mm -hmm. dozens. And I remember when workspaces first came out, it maybe wasn't ready for prime time, but you know, clearly there's, there's momentum there and we're seeing this across the board. Saga, thanks so much for, for coming in this week. Really appreciate it. Um, we're going to be in touch with, uh, with you, with ETR. We're going to continue to report on this. But uh, Saga, Saga, stay safe and, and thanks again. Thanks again. I appreciate it and uh, looking forward to doing another one. All right, and thank you everybody for watching uh, this Cube Insights powered by ETR. This is Dave Vellante for Saga Kadaki. Remember, all these episodes are available as podcasts. I publish weekly on wikibon.com uh, and also on siliconangle.com. And don't forget, go to etr.plus. Check out all the action there. Thanks for watching everybody. We'll see you next time.